Hello, and welcome to Let's Talk Bible. I'm Sonny Chowns. All right, here we go. Uh, we're talking about the uh, underground church, how to build the underground church. I believe it's time to start digging. And uh, step over this way now. Uh, we're dealing with the fellowship, and this is actually part two. Uh, you might recall last time we were talking about the underground church, the fellowship, and who can we fellowship with regards to believers. Well, today we want to talk about the unbelievers, but let's review. You might recall that this entire process is built upon what I see as the biblical plan in Acts chapter 2, verses 46 and 47. Right out the gate, as we have 3,000 baptized, and now what are we going to do? Here's the, the template, if you will, the, 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 the picture of what the early church looked like. Acts 2.46 verse A, or uh, 2.46 A, which means the first part of verse 46, it says they met in their homes. They met in their homes. I think that that's huge. Family has always been the foundation of the successful church, the successful culture for that matter. Homeschool, I believe, is the way we get there. When I say homeschool, I'm not just talking about the children. I'm talking about the family, the home, being the basis, the core for all training so that, generationally speaking, we can pass along the values of God and godliness because our children are totally, all day long, being immersed in the instructive values of the parents. Very, very important. Then you build on top of the family, you build the fellowships. And so you reach outside the biological family, and then you start bringing folks into the, a, a, a fellowship that's a little more broad. And these individuals, home church, they're going to come into your own home, and you're going to start having home churches. I believe that's going to be the pattern of the underground church. I think it's coming whether we want it to come or not. I think that we're going to be forced out of our stale, cold cathedrals and into our more personal homes, and we're going to sit on each other's couches, and we're going to look up at the, the dust that's on each other's ceiling fans. We're going to eat meals at each other's supper, uh, dining room tables, that kind of thing. It's going to become much more intimate. I think it's going to result in a great deal of church growth, but it's going to come about probably because of persecution. Unless there's a few who can join with me on this effort, who have enough vision about where we're going in the future to jump into this arena early with regards to establishing the underground church, I think that some of the folks are just going to get there because they're going to be forced to get there. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So you got your family, you got the fellowship, and then if you go to chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 47, and the Lord added, then you got friends. It's, this is very good for church growth. It's, it's the pattern of church growth. And if you, su if you study the New Testament, you, you find this is what, took, what, took, what takes place. Today, we're into the second part of this idea of fellowship. You might recall that we've already talked about the first one. And I guess we talked about all, all three of them. But we're, what, what I'm going to do is we're going to step outside these, these rings. Uh, let's see, by way of uh, re review, if you weren't with me last time, fellowship of the rings. You drop a pebble in the, in the little pool of water and the rings begin to radiate out, right? Okay, if you want to find that little pebble, you don't start in the outer ring, you start in the middle ring, because that's where the pedal, pebble was, was launched or let go of and, and went into the pool of water, correct? Well, Jesus has a moment, and I, I took that whole idea from this passage, John chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, Jesus has a moment with Nicodemus. He shows up at night and wants to talk to him, and Nicodemus refers to Jesus as a teacher. He also says, you've got to be from God, how else are these signs and wonders being done? And what happens is Nicodemus is on his journey towards the center of the rings, but he only was willing to go through the first ring. The first ring is acknowledge the one true God. He's willing to go that far, but he's not willing to go to the second level, which is acknowledge Jesus is the Christ. No, nope, not going to go there. So he just calls him a good teacher. And then you might notice here at the bottom, Jesus is going to say, unless you are willing to take this journey and go all the way to the center, which is being born of the water and the Spirit, you can't be part of the kingdom of God. As you see this unfold, Nicodemus seems to be only willing to penetrate this, this first level. I will acknowledge the one true God, but I'm not going to call you the Christ, and I'm not going to allow you to baptize me, uh, and we're not going to have a water spirit thing going on. Not going to go that far. Now, did that happen later on in Nicodemus's life? I think it's likely that it did. Remember that Nicodemus is going to be one of those who takes Jesus' body off the cross, etc. But we don't know. And so my opening screen is to show you how this begins to work, the fellowship of the rings. 
We are to be individuals who draw folks into this part right here. The most intimate fellowship you will ever have with somebody is somebody who has been willing to be born of the water, that's baptism, and the Spirit. That's what you get when you're baptized, according to Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. See it? Therefore, let all of us that this God, they, they were willing to come through the first one. We acknowledge that there's a God. They were a bunch of Jews, and so that's not a hard one. And then they're going, he's going to say, Peter's going to reply to them when they find out that they killed God, and what, are we going to, what do we need to do in order to rectify that? They're going to say that you need to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. That's the second ring. So you see, they're journeying towards the center. The second, first of all, they acknowledge that there's a God. Second of all, they acknowledge that Jesus is his son, that he is the Christ, the Messiah. And then third of all, it's Peter is going to say, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the center ring. But how did they get the gift of the Holy Spirit? Tie this together. This and this go together. They're baptized and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So that's water and spirit. That's the pattern of the New Testament with regards to fellowship. So backing it up, when you're out here on this ring, you can have a level of fellowship with individual, but it's not nearly as intimate as this. And when you might even have some friends who are willing to go so far as to call Jesus the Christ. Most of Christendom in America today are willing to go this far, but they're not willing to step inside here. Most of those who call themselves Christians today refuse baptism as being essential for entering into the kingdom of heaven, even though that's exactly what Jesus is going to say in John chapter 3. It's exactly what Peter is going to preach in Acts chapter 2. They refuse to do that. And so those individuals, although the majority of Christendom is right here in this circle, they're not willing to go in here. And I'm going to suggest to you that according to the words of Jesus himself in John chapter 3, unless you go here, you can't be part of the, you can't be part of the kingdom. And so if you're just in this level, I'm concerned for your salvation. I'm concerned for your soul because you are stubbornly refusing to go after the pattern of Scripture, which is to be born of the water and the Spirit. John chapter 3, Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. And so here's the pattern as we draw people to Jesus. They first of all have got to, yeah, there's a God. Yeah, Jesus is his son and died for me. What do I do about it? Yeah, I'll be born of the water, I'll be baptized, and receive God's gift living within me, the Holy Spirit. All right, that's all review from last time. What we need to do now is ask ourselves, but what about the unbeliever? What about the guy who doesn't even believe in one true God? What about that fellow? You might notice that I don't have a ring for him because he's out here. He's beyond. And the reason I say he's beyond is because these levels provide the most significant common ground. If you can find somebody in one of these three levels you're likely to have a, a degree of fellowship with them. And I would suggest to you, if you're trying to lead someone to Christ, if you find somebody in this level or this level, they are prime targets for true discipleship. But sometimes you're going to deal with folks who are way out here. In fact, we're finding that to be increasing in our culture, that there's a lot of folks way out here who don't even acknowledge the one true God. What do you do with those individuals? Is there any approach to those individuals. Yes, there is. In fact, there's a biblical passage we're going to deal with right now that gives us the standard as to how to deal with that. So what about the unbelievers? Folks who are not even in one of these rings, how do we deal with them? In Acts chapter 17, Paul is going to be in a meeting at the Areopagus, and he's going to say this to the folks in Athens. So he's in Greece, okay? The center of paganism as far as multi-gods, uh, paganism as far as Theo, uh, uh, what's, it, what's it called when you have multi, uh, uh, polytheism, poly, many, theism, God, and so they were worshiping anything and everything that they could, and I, I honestly, I, I kind of appreciate that, and I think Paul does too, he's going to say, you're really trying, and he's going to use that as common ground to build upon, and there's going to be three things that we're going to see in this passage that help us know how we can draw the unbeliever into a deeper level of fellowship. Now again, if they're out here, we don't have much fellowship. But we can draw them this direction, and that's what the intention is of Paul in Acts chapter 17. He says, people of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. I think he was trying to say, I, I appreciate the fact that you are religious in the sense religion tends to be man trying to reach God. Okay? And so whatever it may be, man trying to reach a, a more significant higher power, that tends to be the, the concept of religion. And he says, I get it, you're, you're very religious folks. And he says, the reason I know that is because as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, 
I even found an altar with the inscription to a, an unknown God. Now, you know the background of this, but the, the folks in Athens were so enamored with the gods, uh, and, you know, this is where we, we're going to get Zeus and, and Hades and all that stuff, you know, okay? Well, they were so enamored with that that they, they made an altar to anything and everything, trying to make sure that all of the gods were appeased. All of the gods were taken care of. And oftentimes, as you traveled around the Greek world, and at this particular time, it's under the control of Rome, but the Greek culture still had a massive impact. But as you traveled around this area, many of these cities would have their own specific god that they worshipped. Okay. Well, we're in Athens now, the epicenter of polytheism. And he says, I noticed that you had one to the unknown god. A God that you're not sure of, and so it's just kind of a catch-all altar, so that make sure that we didn't miss him. We don't really know your name, but we don't want you to be mad at us. He says, so you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. This is an important point. Notice that they are worshiping. They are trying to worship because they're religious people. They are seeking something. All of us, we're going to see a passage in a moment from Romans chapter 1, all of us have a vacancy in our heart that can only be filled by God because he's the creator. It's kind of, I think this is an appropriate illustration, it's kind of like a, a, an individual who's adopted, and yet for whatever reason, they always long to find their birth mother. And I've known, I've known many folks who were in this situation who didn't really want to know their birth mother because they intended to give up the, the home that they were raised in. They, they love their adopted mom more than they love their birth mother. But there is some kind of a desire to know where I come from. Well, I think part of that comes as a reflection of this, this desire to know God. Because all of us understand that we came from somewhere, and we want to know that higher power. This is part of the key to having some level of fellowship with the unbeliever and drawing them deeper. So he's going to say, I get it. He said, You're ignorant of that very thing that you worship. And he says that, and this is what I am going to proclaim to you. Now, I want you to watch over here because I believe that as we see the points taking place here, the three things that are very significant to talking to somebody who's an unbeliever, we're going to see this pattern steps, if you will, trying to get them to this enter, to enter into this one ring here. And then we'll move them into here and into here. He says, I notice that you're worshiping. You're worshiping. They want to acknowledge something. They're trying their best to reach out and to find something as far as a higher power is concerned. Notice this passage that I promised you. Romans chapter 1, verse 20, Paul is going to say, uh, he's of course making these statements here as well, but he's going to say it in his writings in the book of Romans. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen. Clearly seen, big part. Clearly seen. Being understood, not just seen, but understood from what has been made. Watch it. So that people are without excuse. God is clearly seen. As the weather is changing here in northeast Arkansas and the, and the leaves are falling off the tree and I wake up in the morning and there's this cold frost on the ground, I'm recognizing there has to be some controlling power out there bigger than me, bigger than just kind of random chance in the universe that is taking care of this. All of us have that in our heart. All of us want to acknowledge something. And this is part of the key to reaching the unbeliever. If you want to draw that unbeliever into these rings, one of the first things you've got to do is you've got to help them with their acknowledgement. They may not, they may not acknowledge the acknowledgement, but it's there. All of them have this, this hole in their heart that can only be filled by the Creator. And so one of the things that we have to do is we've got to help them come to worship, come to acknowledgement, of that which is clearly seen, clearly understood, by what has been made. One of the best ways, Paula does it here, obviously, one of the best ways for you and I to reach the unbeliever is to show them the design. Because design obviously points to a designer. Now, I get it. There's a hundred questions that they'll ask you. You know, what about evil? How come God allows evil to exist? Which I would counter with. Are you sure that it is that God wants evil to exist? He does allow it to exist, but is it not because you and I chose to allow it to exist? Maybe a better question for us is why in the world, given all the perversion in the world, 
Why is it all these years later that there's any good left? That might be the bigger miracle here. And I think it's because of the interaction of God. But again, I, I can't run those rabbits so much right now in detail as I just want you to see that if you're going to reach an unbeliever, you've got to start with the acknowledgement that's happening in their heart. Again, they may not acknowledge the acknowledgement, but if you can lead them there, that there's something missing, there's something that they want, there's an order that needs to come to their life. They're, they, they're searching for that, that point of beginning. And the only place you're going to have that satisfied is with the Creator. All right, so the first thing you've got to do is you've got to help them with this acknowledgement. See how we're drawing them into this outer ring? All right, the second thing <coughs> is we need to help them with the Lordship. So first of all, they acknowledge that there's a God. Then we need to help them with the lordship of, specifically, Jesus. But notice, uh, acknowledge the one. There's only one God. You see, in Acts chapter 17, as Paul is dealing with all the plethora of all these other gods, what he is doing as he's trying to deal with these unbelievers is he's trying to narrow it down to just one. There's just one Lord. When you say Lord, they recognize that word as being master, ruler, boss. This guy is supreme. And he's going to say there's just one of them. And so all of these altars that you got scattered around the city, basically they're all worthless. There's only one that's really worth having, and it's the one that acknowledges the Lord. Coming back to our, so we're acknowledging one, oneness. There's just one. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. He is the Lord. He's the one. From one man he made the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times and history and boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. So let's review, and then I'll give you my third point. Number one, you've got to help them with acknowledgement. Everybody wants to go there. They just, for some folks, they don't know where to go. They've had such a horrible life. They've had so many bad things that have happened, abusive parents, whatever it may be. They're just not sure how to acknowledge that there is a supreme being. Once they've acknowledged that, that's good. But, you know, even the demons believe and tremble. They've got to acknowledge the one. We've got to narrow it down. It's not Zeus. It's not Hermes. It's not any of the, the pagan. It's, it's not Allah. It's one. There's just one. And he's called the Lord in this passage, okay? Then the third part is the true God. you got to seek him. But not only that, you got to reach out to him. See, we're starting to move them now towards the center ring. We're trying to get them into this outer ring so that we can eventually get them to acknowledge Jesus as the Christ. Water, But in order to do that, we've got to start way out here and help them with the acknowledgement, help them to acknowledge just one, not multiples, not some false God, just one. And that God, by the way, is the Jehovah God that is described in Scripture. And then he's going to say as he concludes this, that God himself, that one God, he created us with a specific purpose in mind. It says that he marked out our, our appointed times in history and the boundaries of our lands. That means that he, he knew exactly at what time he wanted to put us onto the timeline and exactly where he wanted to place us as far as geography is concerned. God did that. By the way, that's called predestination. God did that, and that's a wonderful thing. But notice this because it's so powerful in the passage. God did that, that, that God that you're trying to find the one God, not a bunch of them, but that one true God that you're trying to find, he's out there. And your job, my friend, and I'm trying to talk to these folks that come into the rings, your job is to, verse 27, God did this so that they would seek him and reach out for him. That's your job. You know, like the little things we got on Facebook and the internet and all that. And all that. You, you, you had one job, just one job. Well, this is it, folks. You got one job, to seek him and to reach him. Reach out for him. Notice this phrase because it's so very important in verse 27. God did this so that. The reason he created us, that's the context, verse 26. The reason that he put us in a specific spot at a specific time, brought us onto the timeline, the reason that you even draw breath, the reason that you're here today is so that you will seek him and reach out for him. That, by the way, is that big hole that's in everybody's heart, the acknowledgement part. If you want to draw the unbeliever in to the circles, we have to, first of all, help them to recognize that they need. They have a hole that has to be filled. Second of all, that hole can only be filled by one divine presence. 
And third of all, that divine presence is asking you to seek him and to reach out for him. Because in that process, you not only are going to find him, but you are going to be in the, the will of the one who gave you a start. That hole that you, how did I even get here? That's going to begin to be filled because you're going to seek the answer and reach out to the answer. And then you, you see how this works as they begin. Then they, they start maturing and they, 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 they discover that this one true God who I'm seeking and I want to know, and I'm finding out that the, his name is Jehovah, and now I learn he has a son, and we killed him. But the reason that it was important for his son to come is because all of this garbage that I've had in my life that came about largely because I had a hole in my heart, he solves that. Yes, I'll acknowledge Jesus as the Christ. But you see, that's where the religious world tends to stop. They just tend to stop with this mental acknowledgement, okay, Jesus is the Christ, therefore I'm saved. And that's just simply not Bible, because what God says is you've got to start over. And a simple acknowledgement, mentally speaking, is not starting over. He says, Romans 6, 3 and 4, you've got to die. You've got to put off the old man of sin. You've got to start all over again. And that only happens when you die in the water and receive the spirit, the pneuma of God. The breath of God himself fills you. That's Acts 2 and verse 38. Baptized for the forgiveness of sins, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so as we start way out here, and again, it, it, it's a process of patience. I get that. But as you start way out here where folks are unbelievers... Help them to recognize that there's something they're trying to find. That's the acknowledgement. And that that's something that they're trying to find is not going to be satisfied by a plethora of gods, by false gods, Allah. It's only going to be satisfied by the one, the one, true God. And the reason he's going to be true to you is because you're going to seek him. And he's going to allow you to find, reach him. Or, and you're going to reach him and he's going to allow you to find him. And in that process, you'll find out that he is the one true God. And that then will propel you into the next circle. You're going to want to know more about this God. And you're going to discover he has a son. And his son is himself is going to say in John chapter 3, you want to be part of the kingdom? I need for you to be born of the water and the spirit. And you see how they're journeying towards the center of the rings? We are the Sonny Childs and Family Ministries, serving as missionaries to this great nation. Please pray for us and consider adding us to your missions giving.